Um, that's for Zoom. Uh, um, thank you to all who made this possible. And um, welcome to the 12th kitchen organized by Kenya for Palestine entitled 1492 in Palestine, Connecting Indigenous Struggles on Land Day. But like to acknowledge, of course, that we are on the unceded and unrematriated ancestral homeland of the Lenape people, which is an acknowledgement that we are living in an armed colonial occupation. The Lenape exists in a rich but forced diaspora. Lenape diaspora includes three federally recognized nations that uh, in what is now called Oklahoma and Wisconsin. These nations um, have active thriving tribal governments that speak and act in their own tribal sovereignty. So on March 30th, 1976, in response to the expanding Zionist theft of land, Palestinians announced a day of protest to assert their right to their homeland. The mobilizations in defense of Palestinian land engulfed the entire geography of historic Palestine, including inside 1948 territories, the West Bank, Gaza, and Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. And uh, in addition, a general strike was organized. These actions mark the beginning of what we now refer to as Land Day. Um, so the Zionist occupation responded in 1976 uh, with the killing, wounding, and incarceration of Palestinians. But to, uh, we remember and commemorate Land Day as a day that characterizes and evidences a Palestinian front united with resistance, refusal, and rootedness in their land across the entire geography of Palestine, from the river to the sea, uh, and extending to Palestinians in exile. Land Day has continued to mark a day where we not only remember the honorable history of the Palestinian struggle, but we actively honor it by struggling alongside Palestinians living under occupation for liberation and return. While Zionist settler colonialism has continued its attempts to sever Palestinians from their land through killing, displacing, and imprisoning, uh, Land Day is a testament to the relentlessness of Palestinian resistance and their steadfastness. The significance of this day is also vividly captured by the Great March of Return, which took place on this day in 2018, where Palestinians in Gaza marched to the border that separates them from the land they were forcibly displaced from by the Zionist entity. We honor the memory of the 230 martyrs and the sacrifice of the 36,000 wounded who were violently targeted by Israeli occupation forces during these marches. On this land day, we also honor the memories of the over 30,000 martyrs who have been killed by so-called Israel in the last six months. We honor the lives of the Palestinians who remain steadfast in Gaza as they continue to be terrorized by invasion and displacement. We honor those Palestinians in Gaza and the world over by committing to struggle alongside them for the liberation of their homeland on this land day and every day until liberation and return. So if you're able to, uh, we hope that you join uh, thousands in the streets tomorrow on the 76th land day to demand a permanent and immediate ceasefire to lift the siege on Gaza, to free all Palestinian prisoners from Zionist prisons, to end the 75 years long occupation of Palestine and to cut all US funding to Israel. So it's in the spirit of struggling alongside the Palestinian people that CUNY for Palestine holds our community teaching series which brings scholars and organizers from within and outside CUNY together to deepen our understanding of the struggle for Palestinian liberation past and present. Uh, we are honored to welcome Dr. Uh, Linda Kikivish and Dr. Mohammed Abdu. Dr. Kikivish is a geographer of Maya roots and author of the forthcoming Palestine 1492, who lived in Palestine from 2010 to 2011, where she researched the uses of maps by both Palestinians and their colonizers. And Dr. Abdu is a North African Egyptian Muslim anarchist 
interdisciplinary activist scholar of indigenous black critical race and Islamic studies, as well as gender sexuality, abolition and decolonization with extensive fieldwork experience in the Middle East, North Africa, Asia and Turtle Island. So I, I came to be introduced to Dr. Kiki Vish's work and consequently Dr. Abdu's through a rich network and lineage of anarcho-indigenism, which exists throughout Turtle Island. Uh, this is a lineage that has existed here for five centuries, a lineage of specific contexts and histories. In law as tactic, Palestine, the Zapatistas and the global exercises of power, Dr. Kiki Vish reminds us that there is a shared logic of domination that functions globally. Her work puts the Palestinian liberation movement into an exchange of analysis with other subjects in struggle and encourages us to critically examine the emancipatory strategies that groups are themselves constructing and sharing with each other for mutual reinforcement. Putting the Palestinian condition into conversation with others beyond Palestine, who are resisting and organizing against the same discriminatory systems whose effects are also violence, dispossession, disenfranchisement, and yes, genocide. From resistance uh, to, log to the logging of old growth forests in the Sierra Madre in Northern Mexico by the Raramuri, to the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and land defenders resisting the coastal gas link pipeline, to the San Carlos Apache resisting the destruction of the spiritual lifeblood of their people at Chichilville de Gautil by Resolution Copper, to the Saponi Nation resisting the Mountain Valley Pipeline, to the Muscogee Creek and the people of Atlanta resisting Cop City. Likewise, in his recent book, is Islam and Anarchism, Dr. Abdu encourages us to situate alliances within our entwined and fraught histories of struggles, responsibilities, solidarities and accountabilities to each other by recognizing how US internal settler colonization is tied to imperialist military adventurism. Dr. Abdu reminds us that decolonization demands unsettling and dismantling the romanticized peer and superior sense of our own identities, histories, and indeed ourselves with humility. Resurgence, political alliance, and decolonial co coalition building demand constant self-reflection, face-to-face community building, and a distinction between morals and ethics. For example, morals such as the overarching principle, thou shalt not kill, do not mean enslaved people do not have the ethical right to resist threats to their values, lands, and lives. However, as ethics are always dynamic, they are inextricably linked to intent and context. Liberation demands the development of an ethics of communal care, an ethics of conflict resolution, and as discussed by Dr. Abdu, what in Islam is referred to as usul al iqtila for mitigating our ethical political differences, especially in light of the authoritarian egoistic tendencies that hinder local, regional, and transnational solidarities. So it's in that spirit of transnational solidarity. Uh, that we welcome Dr. Kiki Vish and Dr. Uh, Abdu, and there will be about an hour. We'll break for iftar. The food just got here. Um, I say we break maybe for whatever feels comfortable. Uh, we can self-direct in the spirit of autonomy. And um, so I'd like to turn it over now to, to Dr. Kiki Vish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, um, and Ramadan Karim, and greetings to my brother Muhammad Abdul, who uh, I met in uh, online about ten years ago, but not in person until very recently. And it was it's very nice to to connect ten years later. Um, I am speaking to you from occupied Shumash lands, and. We're gonna talk about Palestine in a 1492 context, which is not usually common. Usually we talk about Palestine beginning in 1948, increasingly 1917, the historiography of Pal the Palestinian struggle of modern Palestine usually falls somewhere between the early 19th century when Napoleon arrived or the late 19th century when Jews fleeing anti-Semitism in Europe arrived. 
And to push it back to 1492 can be a little bit controversial because there is a discourse that this has been going on forever. And it's something that we try to ward off to give contextual specificity. And so I'm going to try to do that. My brother Mohammed also does that while maintaining contextual specificity and also bringing in these real human tendencies that we have toward domination or liberation. And it's not something that's specific to any religion or any world. These are just human tendencies. And therefore the question of ethics is really important. Ethics in terms of how we relate to the other and how we relate to ourselves. So I'm going to begin by just laying out a few assumptions and thank you so much River for highlighting that piece, Law as Tactic. It was a piece that I was asked to write by Badil, uh, a Palestinian refugee magazine, because I, when I was in Palestine, I would talk about the Zapatistas and I would teach some, some classes or, or facilitate some classes in the camps about the Zapatistas. And so we started talking about law and how international law is a paradox for Palestinians to use because it was international law that created the division and the colonization of modern Palestine. And so then how can we use law as a tactic rather than be subsumed by it? In other words, how can we use law or any of empire's tools as a tool, only as a tool and not become the tool of empire? And it's a, a way to navigate that takes a lot of care and recognition that a strategy is important to guide the use. And that strategy needs to be outside of empire's institutions and mo more of anything outside the flow of the way that empire flows power. And so another assumption, an assumption that I want to lay out that I'll be working with is the assumption that empire destroys the earth. Empire is a flow of power that dominates while the earth is a flow of power that creates and is centered on diversity, on difference, whereas empire is centered on sameness. Another assumption is that Palestine is a global struggle. It's not just relegated to that territory that's been mapped as Palestine. And this is something that the Palestinian struggle was very much active in weaving globally uh, in the 60s and 70s, especially. And then with the idea to create a state, a Palestinian state side by side to Israel, a two state solution, and in particular with the Oslo Accords forward the last 30 years, it has become a struggle that conceptually, geographically has been isolated and not just conceptually, also materially in the condition that Palestinians found themselves 30 years ago, where Israel and the United States and other allies of Israel had neutralized a lot of the regional allies, allyship for Palestine. So assumptions that power flows in hierarchical ways and it also flows in horizontal ways, power as uh, energy, it's as, as energy, as force. And an important recognition is to say that power is not inherently good or bad. It depends on context. So we'll talk about context. And so I'll begin by showing a few maps of what I mean about Palestine being global and why 1492 is important for that. And then I will offer some considerations for us to think about right now, what is the context right now, the global context that, we, we're, that we're in, and what is a geography and a conception of time that is adequate for this struggle as a way to have us, uh, have us feel that we have that permission if we need it, but really that, that, uh, that daring to think the whole thing, to critique the whole thing, all of the world in order to create another world. And, and fortify another world, a world where many worlds fit rather than one world where people have to be the same. So I'll begin with this map. This map is a map of uh, the world, a world map according to Europe in the 15th century. 
And it's very much, uh, it very much ties into a medieval conception of the world uh, coming from Europe, where there are three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and Jerusalem is in the center. And this is really important because when we think about this, this name, the West, when we talk about Europe or the US, Canada, for example, it means West of Jerusalem. And even though Europe does not Europe does not map the world this way, it's still part of its geographic imagination. If we consider that even though we're here in this on this continent, in this continent, and we are to the west of Europe, and Europe is east to us, Europe still forces everyone or tries to force everyone to call it the West, even when it's to the east. And that is a conception that is very much based on the medieval notion of Jerusalem as the center of the world, Asia to the east, Europe to the west, Africa to the south. And what this map shows also is that there that the Americas are here. This is a map that was printed out of what is today Germany in 1580. And it's a map that kind of shows a transition away from this medieval geography, because these lands had been discovered by the Europeans, they didn't know we were here. And so now here we are as a blob, they didn't know what to do with us. And it also has you know, monsters where we are and where Africa is, and then the exotic mer people, the sirens over where Asia, where Asia and the Indian Ocean are. And then the Red Sea is painted red. So it's a very biblical construction of space. And that's really important to understand because when we talk about Columbus's voyage here, often we're told that the reason why he came and the Spanish came and then the Portuguese is because they wanted to be rich. That was secondary to what Columbus and his underwriter Isabella were looking for. And that is to take Jerusalem next after the taking of Granada that had happened also in 1492. The taking of Granada on the Iberian Peninsula by that same Queen Isabella was a holy war. It was a holy war in the sense that it sought to impose one world, the Catholic world on the entire geography of the Iberian Peninsula and, and more generally in Europe. Whereas previously under an Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula, the three monotheistic faiths were able to live side by side by side. And now this is not to say that any Islamic empire is better than a Christian empire. In the end, they're all empires. It is to say that there was a specific understanding of the world coming from Isabella, the Catholic monarchs, and the Vatican at the time that was very apocalyptic and wanted to convert the world, wanted to quote unquote save souls before the coming of the Messiah. And Christopher Columbus believed that the world was going to end, the Messiah was going to come in 155 years, and that it was going to happen in Jerusalem. If you followed the Palestinian struggle, for a bit, you probably already know that this prophecy is still very much alive in Zionism. Most Zionists are not Jewish, they're Christian. They have this idea that Jews need to return to Jerusalem, build the third temple, and then the Messiah will return. And then we'll kill everybody who's not Christian and everyone will go to hell, including Jews. It's a very anti-Jewish prophecy. But there are these alliances between the state of Israel that says that it's there to protect Jews. It claims to protect Jews, although it connects with this Christian Zionist holy war idea of the end of the world. And then that's the justification that they give for the genocide of Palestinians. I want to also point to an earlier conceptions of the world that's related to this three continent map. This is a, a, the, the T and O maps, the conception of the world in the medieval European imagination understood again, just three continents, Asia, Europe, Africa, 
in the Orient, the Orient, the the East was uh, oriented north, which is very common for a lot of native geographies as well, is because that's where the sun rises. And then the O is just the oceans that these continents were surrounded by, and the Nile and the Mediterranean as kind of like a division. In this map, we see also this, this was a um, something that was promoted with the Reformation forward that th that these areas were populated by Noah's three sons, Sem in Asia, Ham in Africa, and Japheth in Europe. And that, and the idea was, according to this myth, that Ham was the cursed son. And so it's a very anti-Black myth that tried to justify the transatlantic slave trade by saying that God cursed Ham, even though that doesn't appear in the Bible, that was just the way that it was read, Reformation forward. And also Sem. So this idea of who's a Semite, according to the European geographic imagination, is relegated over to Asia. And so Jews in Europe were called Semites as a way to point to them not belonging in Europe, them belonging instead to Asia. So this, this biblical myth is very strong, even though Europe doesn't like to talk about itself anymore as following biblical myths. It likes to talk about itself as secular, as rational, but it's a, it's a myth that gives a uh, fuel to this, this a notion of anti-Semitism and also to anti-Blackness with the myth of Hem. And it, this myth of Hem is something that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about. It's very prominent even still today in some churches. So with that, then we start seeing that the, the world map as we know it now looks more like a, a, a grid. And this is what uh, I want to show following Christopher Columbus's voyage is his return to the Iberian Peninsula um, landed him in Portugal. And so when he returned to the Iberian Peninsula after his first voyage, the Portuguese uh, monarchy and the Castilian Aragonese, to be named Spain in the future, uh, those monarchies started to fight. So the Portuguese and the Spanish started to fight. The Pope steps in saying, you all cannot fight. You're Catholics. We're in this together. We're in this to save souls. We're in there to invade and conquer the world in this holy war. And so the Pope draws this line, which is the Treaty of Tordesillas. It happened in between 1993 and 1994. And the idea was that Portuguese could invade anything to the east and Spain, anything to the west, which is why, and it hits right here where Portugal, where Brazil today is. And that is why in Brazil, people speak Portuguese and on to the west, uh, we speak Spanish. Now those are languages that were forced onto us along with Christianity. The Holy War extended onto us uh, our books were burned, we were tortured, our ancestors struggled to and continue to struggle to maintain our other worldviews, our cosmovisions. And with the Maya, they still exist, but all of our books were burned except for four. And those were techniques that Spain had already practiced on Jews and other folks that they considered to be heretics, women, anyone not of the three monotheistic faiths. Though that kind of torture, that enslavement, that destruction of those other worlds was already taking place in Europe before it happened to us. And very soon as the Spanish and the Portuguese start to circumnavigate the globe, they, they, they then need to draw another line over on over to their east to, to show where Spain's limit was going to be, although Spain didn't respect it. And over here in the Philippines, which was supposed to be Portuguese territory, uh, the Spanish invaded anyway. So I what about the hot tea? <laughs> I wonder if Leander, you might mute. Thank you. Um, so I point this out because 
this is the beginning of modern borders. And when we think about what is a border, it tells us a border is an agreement between invaders, between these colonizers so that they don't fight. This border on this border has nothing to do with the earth. There is no consent from the land, no consent from any of the communities there. This is very much a geography from above, a God trick. Very soon, Abiyayala, Turtle Island gets cut up into vice royalties. These are then internal uh, cuttings for more conquistadors so that they don't fight, so that they can administer territories for the crown. So here we have the vice royalty of Brazil, which becomes the state of Brazil. The vice royalty of New Spain becomes the state of Mexico. So state borders continue following this logic of being peace treaties between colonizers and the state of Mexico is still a colonial project, just like Guatemala and Salvador all the way down, just like the United States and Canada. And we see this, <clears throat> excuse me, as well, in the 19th century, late 19th century in Africa, the Europeans get together and they start to cut up Africa for themselves. Again, without consent of the land, without caring about what the consequences were going to be for any of the communities there. This was preceded, the cutting up of Africa, the scramble for Africa was preceded by Europe also cutting itself up into nation states. With the French Revolution and the taking down of the monarchy, there's this problem now of who's gonna govern. And the idea is that the people are going to govern, but then that poses a problem because the stakes are so high, that's a lot of power. What do you mean by the people? So then this idea of the nation and the nation state comes into being. The idea that those who are part of a nation, which means that they speak the same language, they share a history and a culture, they will govern. And so then this creates enormous amounts of problems for anyone who does not fit into this idea of the nation. And this is where we get modern anti-Semitism, where Jewish communities all over Europe, and many of them had been expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. Some had gone to Portugal with the taking of Granada. They were forced to convert to Catholicism. Even if they converted, they were still considered suspect. So there were a lot of Jewish relatives all over Europe. Notably, many had gone to Palestine and had been received in a very in, in a welcome, welcoming way. They didn't come to dominate. They came to live side by side. Well, in Europe, the problem then, the Jewish question arises in, a, in an even stronger way. And this is where we get the rise of uh, political Zionism, the idea that the problem uh, with anti-Semitism does not lay at the feet of the empire, although it does, but instead lays at the feet of Jews. This is Theodor Herzl's idea, the father of Zionism, that the problem of anti-Semitism uh, is a Jewish problem rather than an empire problem. It's an empire problem, except Theodor Herzl like the other political Zionists, they sought help from the empires to create a nation state. As we know today, it's called Israel. It was going to be in Uganda. It was part of this whole scramble for Africa and eventually landed in Palestine. But again, that's a project of empire. It's not how when Jews fled the Iberian Peninsula and went to Palestine to live together, instead it's a project that wanted to create Palestine into a state of Jews and only Jews. So it, see how there's a big difference there in terms of how people relate. We can relate to each other as side by side, or we can relate to each other as superior, inferior, above and below. With the cutting up of Africa, soon what happens, the Ottoman Empire is crumbling, the First World War takes place, which ends up uh, finally crumbling the Ottoman Empire. 
and those lands get cut up. This is the famous secret Sykes-Picot agreement between the Europeans where the new, the new regions, nation states would be created under the mandate system, a colonial system where the British or the French or the Russians, et cetera, were going to have dominion. And this is where we get Palestine. This is where we get this, uh, the cutting up of Palestine. It was going to be an international zone. And notice there's a little, there's a, a pink area there where Akka and Haifa are that the British wanted to have sole, uh, sole uh, dominion over in order to build a pipeline from the Gulf to the Mediterranean. And so again, this logic of cutting up the world is a logic from above to dominate the land. And these lines are agreements between invaders. That's what borders are. The shape of Palestine is very interesting. The shape of modern Palestine is interesting to study because it was an accident of history. We talk about from the river to the sea. Here is the river and here is the sea. So here's the map that we know of that iconic shape of Palestine, the river and the sea. And this, in 1923, Palestine was cut up in that iconic shape. But before that, uh, 50 years before, half a century before, the evangelical Christians from the United States and England came to Palestine to map out Palestine scientifically according to the Bible. So putting religion and science together with empire, they had help from the British engineers, the military. So under the guise of religion and science, they created this map of the Holy Land of Palestine. Uh, but, but it says Western Palestine. And that is because the accident history that the US Americans wanted to map and they weren't very good cartographers or surveyors. And so the English told them, well, why don't you take the east of the River Jordan in case you mess up? Because the most important stuff is to the west of the River Jordan. And in fact, the US Americans did mess up. So we just get the map of Western Palestine, which then ends up becoming that iconic shape when they cut up Palestine with the Sykes-Picot Agreement, that red right there. Then the British, once they colonize Palestine, start mapping Palestine into private property maps. Here's a sheet uh, in Bethlehem where these lines internally start being cut up. And so they, they become uh, agreements between quote unquote owners. Now the land is property and they become agreements between these quote unquote owners over who's going to have dominion over what. And then of course we get from this, in the early days, we start getting Jewish settlements in uh, this four panel map, which I imagine everyone has seen before. This four panel map of uh, at, on the eve of the Nakba, the white parts had been titled, they had been uh, settled with a title, with, in, with individual property title, which then made land more easily sold to outsiders. And this was very controversial because land had not been treated that way by and large throughout Palestine. And because once the land was titled with, with ownership, it ended up getting sold to outsiders, to European Jews who would then kick out the Palestinians because again, the Zionist project is not a, not a project where Jews can come and be safe somewhere. It's a project for only Jews and that's it. And so I want to also then, with, uh, with this last map, point out how the legacies of colonialism continue. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu on September 22nd, two weeks before October 7th of last year, was at the United Nations showing a series of maps. And I got a phone call from the refugee camps that I work with to tell me to go look at his maps. And he showed this map that he calls Israel in 1948 that shows Palestine. So he's completely erasing Palestine and of course lying. 
and then talks about how with all of these uh, normal normalization agreements, these peace agreements with neighbors, that now they can finally draw. He draws with his red marker. Now there can finally be that pipeline that had not been possible before because of the Palestinian resistance and because the resistance had a lot of support from the neighboring regimes. Today, that support does not exist. Saudi Arabia on the eve of October 7 was to normalize and still wants to normalize with Israel, meaning that it wants to um, forsake completely the Palestinian struggle. And once that were to happen, then the, the fear has been that the Palestinian struggle would be over. And that same phone call that I received on um, after September 22nd, the day after, the compas there told me that they didn't think that they had even two years left for the Palestinian struggle, that people weren't paying attention anymore, that these regimes were not uh, supporting anymore. And then if, if, if that was going to be the case, then the Ummah, the Muslim world, was not going to support the Palestinian struggle anymore. What we saw with October 7 is that we have a split between the above and the below that has become more clear. And that split is those with power, those who are these plantation overseers, what we can call nation states or even states, whether they're nation or not, because it's even questionable what nation are they even talking about now? They're talking about states, instruments of force over a containerized territory. And so, a couple of weeks after, or a week after actually October 7, I get another phone call from the camps telling me that a new analysis is required. Who is it that's, that we're fighting? Who is fighting us? It's not just Zionism. It's not just the United States. It's not just the West, because also the East, all of these regimes are part of the class wants to destroy the Palestinian struggle. So there's a whole new analysis that we need to develop and fortify that is adequate to our times. And for that, we, we can turn to other movements in struggle, which is very important to understand that movements are thinkers. I know I'm not a lot of knowledge production takes place in academia, but there's an over-representation of knowledge coming out of academia that does not recognize that those who don't have degrees are brilliant. And in fact, those who are fighting a life and death struggle, a struggle for life, are actually quite profound in their analyses and thinking about what is happening. And this is something that academia is often late to understanding. And in fact, in academia, it's really hard to get out of this above and below circulation of power, of hierarchy, over to a side by side by side, because academia itself is inherently that way. It ranks through grades, A, B, C, D, F, and through this ranking, especially of your faculty over, you know, between student and then associate, assistant professor, associate, the, 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 the rankings keep going ad infinitum. And so it's really important to understand movements as thinkers. There's a new book that, uh, Compas and I over here put help put together of the writings of the Zapatistas on the Fourth World War, which they talk about, they've been talking about for the last 30 years. And in fact, there's a documentary that I really recommend everyone watch. It's free to stream online. It's called The Fourth World War. It came out in 2003. Maybe some of you have already seen it. And it's narrated by Suher Hamad, a Palestinian. And it comes out right after 9-11 shows that we are in a global war where the geography is scrambled. There's a first world in the third world and a third world in the first world. And the enemy can be anywhere now, according to empire, which is an empire of money. The sovereign is not the state. The sovereign is global capital, which is what we, what we learned after the Soviet Union fell, that everybody just about accepted capitalism. And now what they're fighting over, if they're even critical of anything called imperialism, most of the time they're only critical 
of U.S. imperialism, and they want many, many empires. And that is not a critique of capital, and it's not a defense of life. It continues this, this process of dominating the earth that has led us now to this climate catastrophe that we're in, in this planetary emergency. The name of the documentary is called The Fourth World War, and it's produced by Big Noise Films. And if you want to read more about the Zapatistas theorizations of the Fourth World War, you can uh, uh, go to bookshop.org and type in EZLN, which is the Zapatistas uh, military initials, and then Fourth World War, and you can find the book there. The publisher also uh, has it for free for download as well. And I'll just wrap up because you're probably wondering what was the Third World War? The Third World War was a badly named Cold War, which was cold only between NATO and the USSR, but was very hot for the South. So I'll leave it there. I may <clears throat> your first map that showed the three leaves are exactly the biblical uh, Noah story from the days of the flood, the way he gave the areas and he, you know, uh, divided them between Sam Ham and yeah, it's very important. Thank you. So we're going to keep all the Q&A for the end. Um, thank you for that question, but we're going to go with the second speaker now. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Shalom al-Khayim, our Jewish kin. My Jewish kin. Ramadan Karim to those uh, capable of observing. Uh, it's an honor to be with you all. Um, thank you, Kumi, for Palestine. Thank you, River, for your labor in terms of organizing this. I know it's not easy, especially under these circumstances of duress. Uh, my sister in Kupa Kiki, uh, I miss you. Uh, it's an honor to be with you and this panel. I wish you were here. You are with us in spirit, though. Um, you're my heart, and I can't do without my heart. Um, and inshallah, I'll be seeing you soon in a couple of weeks' time. Um, usually, I begin all my talks, um, and it's an honor to, to be with you all. Thank you very much for being here, uh, my compas. Usually, I begin all my talks with uh, the prayer of Musa, alayhi salam. Allahumma shrah li in the Quran, Allahumma shrah li sadri, wa yasir li umri, wa hlul uqtabin min lisani ya fawqawli. Allahumma shrah li sadri, O Creator, may you open thy breast to Esther, the Amri, and make my affairs easy. Wahlu al uqtat and milisani ya fawqawli, and undo the knot in my tongue such that my speech is accessible to you. This was Moses' prayer when he was meeting Pharaoh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent with him his brother Aaron. Uh, to speak. Um, forgive me because uh, at least someone in the audience, uh, a student of mine, must have heard this talk. Um, and we talk a lot these days, including myself, a lot, perhaps more than we uh, need to, as much as education, well, learning. Because saying education means that we're submitting ourselves to somebody that educates us, as opposed to the fact that we would be learning together, as the Prophet used to say holding each other's hands, we, we each ask one another uh, what each of us knows, and this is how we build tomorrow together. That is what I learned from them, and, and having had the honor of living with them and encountering them on at least two separate occasions. Um, again, I'm very humbled to be with you all, and on the way here, you know, there were three numbers that were sort of, my head was, was rotating around, 531 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, 10 days, we're in the last 10 days, Akhar Ashur in Ramadan, and 174 days um, since the genocide became official. Um, 
officially in courts, not genocide, obviously, the ethnic cleansing has been going on for a very long time. And I pondered, you know, because I, I like I said, I've, I've said the speech quite a fair number of times. I, in fact, it's probably reminiscent of the speech that I gave at the socialism conference in September. So prior to the events of October 7th. And, you know, Einstein had defined, you know, that uh, insanity is, is um, the repetition of things over and over again, uh, expecting different consequences. And, and perhaps I'm going to embrace, you know, not so much, well, the, the thread between insanity and madness is quite finite insofar as the legality and, and the medical condition uh, of it and not to undermine those whatsoever. But perhaps I will embrace some madness mm -hmm. in the hopes that um, it alter a change, um, you know, um, River was kind enough, and of course, uh, Kiki reiterated and, uh, and reminisced because this is not a matter of uh, superficiality or artificiality. Um, and a settler of color um, on stolen land, um, on Lenin Lape territory at this instant and moment in time. Uh, and land acknowledgments, as I learned from my indigenous elders and having been involved in land defending for over 20 something odd years, is about intent, purpose, and action. So I'm going to say that again it's about intent, purpose, and action. Uh, intent, purpose, and action. That means, amongst many things, understanding treaties, communities, um, centering indigenous people, because indigenous people are not an add on unit of analysis, intersectional analysis, wokeness. Um, <laughs> in whitewashed, uh, blasé uh, ways um, as academia, as even movements from the hate and disdain age, though I'm uh, disheartened by the degree, and there's a lot to be disheartened about, to which a lot of events, let alone a lot of marches, which are simply marches, and I don't mean to be demean of marches, but I'll talk about the difference between mobilization and organization, because I don't see or hardly see any organization. What I see is mobilization, which is rather a shame. Don't even begin with the element and dimension of land acknowledgments that alone include, really, were centered indigenous people beyond the tokenization of them at the front of protests. I'm sorry, we're Zionists on stolen land. I'm a Zionist on stolen land. You know, Satsu Hadrin, you know, if you fail to recognize the scope and the nature of the enemy, you will always succumb in every single battle. Uh, America, as had been noted uh, by my kin, uh, by my compas, is, is very much false to the present and false to the future. It's based upon a genocidal past, present, future, a homicidal present, and a suicidal future. And uh, again, something, because I'm sorry, I'm, I'm filled with a great deal of rage and, and amongst many other emotions and feelings, which as a person of color, uh, I think BIPOC people particularly are entitled to, given the fact that we've been born into a war before we even come to recognize and know uh, our conditioning within that war, let alone our complicities in relationship to one another and to our, as our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, and what the hell is BIPOC when it's a liberal form and manifestation of identity politics that assumes that there are Black, Indigenous people or Afro-Indigenous people in the form of Black Mi'kmaq, Black Tripris, let alone Black people of color, all these acronyms as LGBTIQ, but this is the wonder of liberal identity politics that we feel is going to lead to some kind of amelioration and liberation. We are talking about survival as opposed to thriving. We are conditioned to talk about resistance, which is reactionary as opposed to liberation. Our people deserve to feed. And I don't think we understand what it is that we're, we are worth in terms of dignity and respect and what it is that we are owed. We are running after as a dog, chasing a car, settling for the scraps that the white man benevolently gives to us is uh, some kind of benevolent charity that any of us. Uh, I, I'm sickened by diasporic Arabs and Palestinians uh, that lie to ourselves, I don't know, um, or perhaps we lie to the public. There are many lies that we tell nowadays. Uh, this is a religious and racial war. I'm going to say it again, this is a religious war, and anybody who says otherwise is either ignorant of history or lying to you all um, in this settler colony. Um, but before I get to that point, which you know, Kiki had sort of forayed and, and uh, my creator and the ancestors bless her uh, for her work and research, which is absolutely foundational uh, and, and fundamental to the point of discussion that we are having today. We are in a state of urgency and emergency. There are three things that very much condition this contemporary epoch or moment that we are witnessing that have never existed. Um, 
prior. Uh, number one, our, 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 our mother earth that we desecrated, that we raped, that we pillaged. Uh, our mother earth that is a subject. Who is a subject? She's not an object. She's not a possession. She's not to be anthropomorphized as property. Uh, she has her own timetable and schedule given global warming. And our mother earth does not distinguish between an indigenous land defender um, and the white supremacist. She doesn't operate that way and that doesn't make her any less reasonable or rational or according to our dictums of rationality and what is rationality, but the region carved after that, which is irrational to somebody, creator is irrational. Uh, so rationality, rationality is very much overrated. Number two, that we have developed the means, the endless means to create in Sat Hiroshima's Nakasapis in an instant in a moment of time, means of destruction. And number three, that we have become desensitized and, and uh, preconditioned that we are gotten to the point that we are scrolling through a genocide uh, on devices, mined and produced from another genocide in the Congo, and assembled vis-a-vis -vis another ethnic cleansing vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghur in China. Um, America is leading to this war, make no mistake about it. Israel is but a mere instrument in its, ar in its arsenal. Uh, settler colonialism, as Patrick Wolf had noted, is a structure, it's not an event. 1492, we have to understand it's symbolic, it's spiritual, it's historical and its material significance. You see, a number of immigrants or migrant Muslims and non-Muslims for that matter don't comprehend the fact that American society is animated by white supremacist religious doctrines, religious doctrines, the Magna Carta, the Manifest Destiny doctrines of discovery, paranoia, Protestant conceptualizations of, of common law, property rights, Victorian notions of gender and sexuality. So there's this love for this profound American dream, this work of progress that Obama represents Sorry, for, forgive me again, the ankle palm black. There are many black skin, red skin, brown skin people with white masks, but say la vie, this is the you know drone president, Wall Street president, as Cornell West had called it. Mm -hmm. But, anyways, um, this is an American nightmare, as Malcolm had always referred to it. So let me tell you a brief story that picks up on what my sister Tiki had noted. And in 1492, there are two things that happened historically speaking. Uh, of course, the Muslim and uh, uh, Jewish eviction and murder and persecution and forced conversion at the hands of the sword by Ferdinand and Isabel, the form of uh, continuation of the Crusades, if you will. Uh, 1492, in that significance of a year, is year zero, as the man say it, as many scholars as I, as Kiki, as many thinkers, intellectuals, and movements, very rarely, uh, conceive of it. Uh, Muslims and Jews were referred to as savages and heathens, savages being the racial descriptor, heathens being the religious descriptor simultaneously. As Alan Michael writes, and I build upon all this work and, and what it is that I'm arguing and saying and sharing, uh, I will do also kindly for listening, in God's shadow that Columbus had described the, the uh, indigenous Taino people or the weapons that they were using as Alpanjis, which is the Spanish name for uh, the weapons that Muslims used, which was the scimitars. In fact, Hernan Cortez, who was the Spanish conquistador, had referred to Aztec temples, the 400, as Moorish mosques. He had referred to Aztec women as Moorish women. He had referred to Montezuma, the Aztec leader, as a sultan. The new world is built in the image of the old. We are continuing this ongoing Jew crusade, and George Bush had said it during the Iraq war. And when they say it, you better believe what it is that we're just, what it is that they're saying. Now, you know, to put a matter of fact into into dimensions, it wasn't just the theft of land, the murder of over a hundred million by lowest common estimates of my indigenous skin, of our indigenous skin, if you will. But then, of course, settler colonialism relies on, on plantation slavery, and a third, a fifth of the transatlantic slaves. Our brothers and sisters were Muslims from their black Muslims from their Jerem Peninsula on the west coast of Africa. So you want to tell me that this is not a religious war, that religion has nothing to do with it. And I get the complexities of religion, particularly so far as Muslims having been exposed to conservative co interpretations of Islam, authoritarian interpretations of Islam. We can sit down and discuss that. As well as liberal progressive, we're here with dear Muslims, you know, I mean, for God's sake, Ilhan Omar at the height of the LM. And this is not to condone the false anti Semitism or anti Jewish, let me put it that way, given that Arabs are Semites too. But anti Jewish uh, sentiments that were directed and attacks that were directed, let alone the anti Blackness, 
uh, uh, that she confronts, but she's sitting down and flanked by Angela Davis at the height of BLM, and she comes about and says, well, come, this country is founded upon slavery. Actually, or genocide, actually, it's an ongoing genocide sister, and it's founded upon slavery, actually, it's after, like, the slavery project, stand your ground, law, school to, uh, school to prison pipelines, and so on and so forth, as part of this ongoing nexus. Right. And she says, look at me, I'm an example of the American dream. And to interview, she was asked, well, who do you hold in so far as uh, examples that you aspire to? And she names Margaret Thatcher, the mother of uh, the Iraq war and the architect of the Iraq war. And uh, oh, sorry, Margaret Thatcher, sorry, the mother of neoliberalism and Madeleine Albright, the architect of the Iraq war. Forgive me, it's been a long day. But indigenous people whose very land that we stand on. Um, and just to, again, put things into perspective, 8% um, of the US population that represent 2% of police killings, murders, extrajudicial. They're incarcerated at 38% higher than the national average. Indigenous people are 30% more likely than whites to be referred to juvenile courts. Indigenous people who are undergoing genocide, we're talking about close to, almost, although we don't know the exact numbers, almost five or over 5,000 missing indigenous women. At least in so far as 2021, they are more disappeared at a rate equal to more than two and a half times their estimated share of the US population. Indigenous women are twice as likely to be raped in comparison to white women. Murder is the third leading cause of death for Indigenous women. From 100 million, we talk to now fewer than 2% of the US population. It took the planning, ongoing planning, legislation, viciousness, forced re relocation, residential schools, starvation contaminated smallpox blankets, bounties on their scalps in a society in which cavalry troops have now been replaced by slave catching police, incarceration, desecration of their lands, foster care, lack of infrastructure and services, poverty as a tool of ethnic cleansing, but the genocide of course continues today. And they continue to be deemed um, apologetically as Indian savages, merciless Indian savages in the US Declaration of Independence and within such societies, our societies. That's to say, of course, nothing with regards to the boarding school systems and their living impacts up until this day, a 150 year program of separating children from their families vis-a-vis -vis federal policies to eradicate indigenous communities, identities, and forcibly take their lives. Of course, we could sit down and talk about how the white man had insidiously used blood quantum with indigenous people in order to dispossess them. The one drop rule dispossessed them for land and, and it, it, it's effects that function differently with our black kin that was meant to cater the slave slave. 408 boarding school institutions in 37 states between 1819 and 1969, that's to speak nothing with regards to Canada up north, mm -hmm. many of which were run by churches and religious institutions, and yet the Catholic Church has to yet offer at least, at the very least, an apology. 431 schools identified in total, and we're talking about 20 of the schools accounted for over 500 children deaths. There are over 50 mass burial sites, and again, we still don't even have the accurate numbers. The emotional, physical, and sexual abuse still remains. In addition to malnutrition, overcrowding, the lack of health care, indigenous children were given English names and had their hair cut, they were scalped. They were forbidden from speaking their own mother tongues and from engaging in their own cultural practices. Kids who died because of abusive experiences and were often buried in unmarked graves on school grounds. The US paid for a large portion of the system of forced assimilation with money superficially owed to Native Americans. Somehow everybody has to hyphenate their American identity, the Native American, the Black, the Asian American, the Muslim American, the queer American, the this American. Yet the only person that doesn't have to hyphenate their name is the white American because they are assumed to be the native of the land. They are the American. Anyways, indigenous people of Turtle Island are only become fetishized only when it comes to national football teams is, I don't know, the, Rash the Washington Redskins, the Chiefs, or unless they're on weapons of war, Tomahawk weapons and Apache helicopters. But then we also have, as I noted, as Sadia Harmon refers to as afterlife to slavery projects that are constantly rebirthed. Send your guard laws, police brutality, policies of broken windows, voter disenfranchisement, impoverishment, premature death, 1994 crime bills, and the Hillary Clinton, and of course, Mr. Soft imperialist Zionist Bernie Sanders, that a bunch of Palestinians there call Ammo an affectionist name, had voted for. And that superficially target black and brown youth, but particularly black youth, that are referred to as super predators and thugs. <coughs> you know, uh, 
Nukrama, Lumumba, Sankara, Walter Rodney, Kwame Turi, you know, uh, had noted a long time ago that our people, and they were anti-colonialists, right? And we wish to talk about the distinction between anti-colonialism and decolonization. I know I'm very much running late in terms of time, but what is time? So forgive me and grant me a <laughs> bit of patience with you. Um, just beginning to scratch the surface, sorry. Um, um, our, but they noted that our people had never seen religion as the opium of the masses. Right. Uh, that, of course, comes directly from the white plan. For Africans and African people, and I am a North African, religion and revolution go hand in hand. And as Kwame Turi has noted, you cannot be revolutionary with that. In engaging with religion, again, we're talking about connecting with land, our mother earth that produces the very air, uh, air that we breathe, let alone the food that we eat. She's a spiritual subject. So how, how, how can we need to sit down and talk about the difference between spirituality and in Islam, Iman, the concept of mu'minin that is central in the Quran, because Iman means belief and believers. And that is more quoted in the Quran as a reference point than the word Muslim that is mentioned five or six times, as a matter of fact. So we need to chart, as my word charts, what are the characteristics that define a believer? But we need to distinguish between demand, faith, spirituality, and religion, which is the closest approximation in, in Arabic is the word deen, that really doesn't encapsulate elements of the oral tradition. I mean, what is this amorphous thing that we live this linchpin we call Islam? Is it referring to scientific innovations, architecture, culinary tastes, and so on and so forth? Islam to me is exceptional, but it has made, been made as an exceptional other when one looks at No Dakota, a land of thunders being referred to as jihadi terrorists by paramilitary corporations as Tiger Swan. It is the quintessential enemy in the eye of a Christianity that was usurped underneath Constantine and weaponized as an imperial war of conquest. So um, we need to talk about the difference between institutionalized and non-institutionalized faith, particularly so far as Judaism and Islam. Like I said, it is a war uh, not between Muslims and Jews, but one that Muslims and Jews have been conscripted into vis-a-vis -vis white supremacist imprints mm -hmm. of Christianity and the formation and manifestation of Zionism insofar as Judaism that usurped this beautiful Eastern tradition, as well as Islam in the form of Wahhabism and Muslim Brotherhood thought. So let's be very clear, but Christianity is also an Eastern tradition. Where is Jesus of Nazareth who stood Nazareth, who stood for the poor, who stood with Mary Magdalene? Where is Moses who stood before Pharaoh? Where is Muhammad who stood for social justice? That is my question. That is the Islam that I seek. That is the Judaism that I seek. That is the Christianity that I seek, that I'm inspired by. And so I find the inanities rather astounding. The Islamophobia, the anti-spiritual and anti-religious animus that animates leftist movements, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we have federations as Nat Turner, as Malcolm, as MLK, as Tolstoy, as Shariati, as Dorothy Day, as Jack Ilul, as Abu Dhar al Jafri, to name a few. But yeah, let's reinstantiate that all religion is evil. And I'm saying this particularly to anarchists, no God, no masters. And yet they venerate, including Marxists. That Marxism has become a religion, that anarchism has become a religion just as much as capitalism and the nation state have their own bearings of religion. Right. So solidarity is a verb, and there's the solidarities of the love, and the solidarities, as my sister Kiki had mentioned, of the below. But we don't invest in the below because we don't get to know one another because we're sitting down and engaging in marches where we have the conservative, queerophobic Muslim, by the queer Muslim and all kinds of queer communities, by the anti-Zionist Jew, by you know, an anti-religious leftist contingent. And yet nobody is talking and everybody is screaming free, free Palestine from the river to the sea without talking about the ethical political commitments upon which the supposedly liberated Palestine is going to manifest, let alone our responsibilities here. And yet we're out to liberate Palestine. What sort of facetious facade are we engaged in? Mm -hmm. And many scholars like Anne Yonte, Amy Cesar, before him, Prince Fanon, the beautiful Fanon, Sylvia Winter, Ricky Dussel, have long pointed out, and I've worked with Sant, that secularism is a colonial crusading construct. It masks its pristine ethos that way. So we must acknowledge that the represented democracy is not much of a democracy when it's, re when it's laden with racialized district free mapping, voting disenfranch disenfranchisement, excuse me, and suppression, partisan gerrymandering, dark money ads, electoral colleges, two, uh, 2010 Citizen United verdicts, Bills like 5014C uh, that allow for special interest groups and so on and so forth. Islam and 1494 are very much the elephants in the room. 38 million refugees and displaced people since the war on terror. We're talking about 4 million that have been 
murders as a consequence of post 9 11 war zones. Empire loves euphemisms, oh. you know, uh, and we live in an era in which there's a liberal hollowing out of words, of slogans, spread freedom and social justice that I live in the Um, All these troubling times that we're living, or these are this Orwellian moment, this prophetic double speak, as he noted in 1984, right? Empty and liberal hollowed out words like axes of evil, war against their simulated drowning. Preventive war, civilians killed are referred to as casualties of war, CAA kidnappings are referred to as extraordinary renditions. And we replicate these euphemisms. It seems that a lot of people want to pretend to be revolutionaries and talk revolutionaries as opposed to actually being revolutionaries. And the fact of the matter is, as Martin had noted, that the children are coming home to roost. Wadi al Fadiya, a six year old, was stabbed 26 times by his family's landlord in Plainfield Township in Illinois. This is after October 7th. And of course, his mother was stopped too. A six-year-old boy by his landlord used to play with him and bring him towards a white man. The chickens are coming home to roost. Excluding and operating according to narrow conceptualizations of spirituality feeds into the colonial world of the above. Any movement that is revolutionary has to have three things, as far as I'm concerned, as is Zabedis does not mean, as history should teach us. Number one, the creation of decolonized learning, propaganda. We are in the business of propaganda, and that can manifest in many different forms, in art, in cinema, it can manifest in so far as literature, pamphlets, all sorts of stuff. Pardon me. Before I do one minute, so sure. we can break for Ithar if you would like to reserve the answer. Sure. Would that be okay? Yeah, that'd be Sorry, no, of course. Um, if I may just complete this one thought, and then we'll, we'll break for a third. Um, so the propaganda, number two, the creation of alternatives, schools, hospitals, ways of seeing, ways of existing in the world. And number three, the preparation for armed defense as a tactic, not as a strategy. Decolonization is inherently violent. I'll leave these three things with you. Let's break for a third, inshallah. May Allah accept our fast. Uh, and let us continue. And sorry, I, I know I'm running over the 20 minutes or so allocated, but thank you. Thank you. Don't be shy. <laughs> I mean, that's where I got. 
Hey, I just want to let you know we'll be back shortly. Okay, anyone who can see me or hear me, um, we're just breaking for FTR. We'll be there soon. Thank you.
down already so maybe we can resume now even though we're not at 45 yet but we can go through it right so, so yeah I'll come in if you'd like to continue and um then when you're finished we can open it up for a q a okay yeah, thank you all again for your patience um all of you who are here face to face uh where we're able to see each other's eyes uh as I was saying, and those that are virtually as well, that this is the thing about math. Um, I believe I talked about the three dimensions that make any revolutionary movement in terms of organizing, not mobilizing, revolutionary. Um, we're talking about land, yeah? Uh, who controls the land insofar as the so-called United States of America? Most BIPOC people are disconnected from land. We live in the urban metropolis, but who controls the land? So what farmers across the I-4 Rust Belt corridor, and they are armed to the teeth with stamped decrees, and they're prepared to go Yuha if necessary, and they feed the metropolis. And yet we are disconnected from land, land that we're supposedly held to free. We're dispossessed from it. Uh, but this is the conundrum of language that we use, uh, insofar as land back and otherwise, insofar as terms, ideologies, identities, as anarchism. Tell me. Does it make sense that I identify as a Muslim anarchist or an anarchist Muslim? What comes first? What if I believe that Islam is inherently anarchistic? What if it developed a Quran of the oppressed? One for the meek of the earth, one for the poor. And I use the Quran particularly in my work because any Muslim, whether you're regardless from the nation of Islam, an Ismaili, a Sufi, an Ahmadi, whatever it may be, a Shiite, ultimately that is the one barometer, the one caliber that holds Muslims together, regardless of discrepancies over the old tradition, the Hadith, the prophetic practice. Uh, the Sunnah. We're not individuals, we're networks of relations of power, and this is how power functions. The state is not some abstract entity that exists over and above us. Rather, we already govern one another vis a vis a set of horizontal asymmetrical relations that lie between us. And so I'm endowed with certain privileges and complicities. And you could be an Afghani taxi driver that had to migrate and leave Afghanistan in the wake of the Taliban that the CIA had set up and funded and logistically supported to counter the Soviets, but ultimately, although you may not share the same privileges as the white man, you are still complicit as a settler on stolen land. So privilege and settlerhood uh, or and complicity don't necessarily function the same way. In the words of Jeremiah Wright, and to cement this dimension of so-called America, when it came to treating indigenous people, um, she placed them on reservations. When it came to Japanese people, she put them in internment camps. When it came to black people, she put them on auction blocks. She put them in chains and slave quarters and cotton fields and substandard housing. She exposed them to the lowest paying jobs, put them outside the equal protection of the law. She relegated them outside and unworthy of affirmative action. And the bastions of so-called higher education, America locked them up into positions of hopelessness, locks us all up in positions of hopelessness and helplessness, bigger prisons, three strike laws. And then she wants us to sing, God bless America for killing us. But we are in a moment in history and time in which, well, supposedly Black Lives Matter or don't matter anymore. I don't know anymore. And so far as the Black Spring, as Robin DJ Kelly had referred to it, because apparently we have jumped onto Palestine now. And before that, there was no Dakota. And before that, there was the Arab Spring and so on and so forth. What Black Lives Matter don't matter in Africa? There are no Trayvon Martins, Michael Browns, Sandra Blands, Brianna Taylors. Please. I mean, this is this is the madness that I'm speaking of. And what does that mean in the context of Africa? Africa, the size of the US, Canada, East and West Europe, Japan, and China. That is how big Africa is. What does black liberation mean? We're in a wake of 69 cop cities being built all over the so-called US. Mm -hmm. We're in the wake of the explosion of two atomic bombs and the dropping and destruction of some schools, hospitals, all means and faucets to life, 247 mosques three churches, 199 heritage sites. Palestine is doing everything that it can. The Palestinian people are doing everything that they can, but are we putting our lives genuinely on the line beyond mobilizing and beyond just handing ourselves over to the police to, in a certain sense, get arrested? 
this becomes the question as far as organizing and organizing can only happen in the land with indigenous people at the center. And that also means abolition, but that means letting go of the state as an instrument of liberation. As a, given the fact that it's a Euro conceptualization of governance, a modality that we have internalized, fascism is a mass psychology, we've all internalized authoritarian tendencies. And again, this speaks to the poverty of words that have been placed on our tongues. Trump is not a fascist, he was seeking to become a totalitarian, and everybody that wants to understand the difference between totalitarianism and fascism now only read either George Jackson or even Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism or William Reich's The Mass Psychology of Fascism. My father, my Edipal father, is the nation state. Mother is capitalism, have been socialized with authoritarian tendencies as a consequence of those upbringings. Materialism, to commodify, materialize, constructive every relationship as an instrument of utility. Valentine's Day, Hallmark cards, that's what it signifies. Gay pride, Heineken balls, and so on and so forth. Corporate pride, and so on. BDS is great. Locking ports, shipping, commercial routes, travel, trade, even ruining a white liberal's day is great. It's great, but that is not organized. That is not organized. Solidarity involves developing an ethics of disagreement and a politics of hospitality, mm. as River had mentioned earlier, and such that a way that we may get to know one another, but how can we get to know one another when we're only meeting in mobilizations? And those offer opportunities for catharsis. They offer opportunities for us to get to know one another, but they are not a guarantee that we will be building with one another. And so far as coalitions, that has to happen on the land. We have to get to know one another, given the stereotypes that we've internalized of one another. My choices as a Muslim will not be between a crusading Wahhabi Zionist alliance on the one hand, and a supposed multipolar, imperialist, striving, totalitarian, Russian, Chinese axes on the other. Those are not going to be my choices. As a Muslim, that means going back to my own traditions. For God's sake, Islamophobia is being mobilized insofar as the Uyghur, insofar as Dalits and Kashmiris, insofar as look at how Hindu Taba is using Islamophobia, and look at how Myanmar is, has militarized Buddhism in fundamentalist and conservative ways in order to clamp down on its peoples there. We're operating with regards to false choices, and this becomes the problem. The lesser of two evil arguments. By what standard of mortality can the violence that is being used by a slave to break this chain to be considered as the same violence that is being used by a slave master? Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney. We're playing the game of oppression in the Olympics. We're playing the game of propping up denizens of purity on Twitter. That is a form of activism now. This armchair activism, these celebrity activists that have never had organizing experiences. Where are our organizers? Why aren't we hearing from them? Why is it the same discussions propped up by the same set of individuals according to the same set of identity politics? I'm not going to prop up a Palestinian's name simply because they are Palestinian. I'm sorry, I reject that because there is an element of racism and tokenization as much as I would not do the same thing with somebody who's Black just because they're Black. This is how movements get co-opted. This is how people get to tokenized. Look at Sean King. Look at the grifting, look at the endless continuation of this mass facade that we're constantly reproducing within our own movements. This becomes the problem. To me, I could care less if you identify or are identified as Black, as Jewish, as queer, as Muslim. I could care less for these labels. What are the ethical, political, spiritual commitments that inform your Blackness, your Christianity, your Judaism, your whatever it is set of acronym, acronyms that you have taken on? You cannot deal with the question of pinkwashing, and I shudder to think that pinkwashing can even be addressed insofar as Palestine without dealing with the nexus of pinkwashing insofar as homo nationalism and settler colonialism here. That is how the term developed insofar as it's anchoring here with regards to settler colonialism here. And the anchor of pinkwashing is not anti just Arab or anti Palestinian, it is Islamophobia, as those who have theorized it, namely Maim Makdeshi, Jasper Four, and others. We're losing our words, we're losing our language. There is no state solution to Palestine or Turtle Island. In 1917 and 1948 narratives, as my sister Kiki had noted, as the anchor of my work will not get us anywhere. That's still bound by the forces and the contours of the nation state and British post-colonialism. My question to BIPOC people, do, you not have, do we not have the capacity to redeem dangerous day again? Do we not have our own governance models that existed in pre-modern history such that we have to rely on the white man's conceptualization of governance, of economics, 
Do we not have any sense of dignity, any sense of pride? And no, there is no such thing as an Islamic caliphate, let alone an Islamic state. The, the state did not even exist within the context of pre-modernity. And Muslims and Arabs had used a term that did not mean state, namely duwayla, from the Quran that means the opposite of state because duwayla, for anybody who knows Arabic, including Arabic speakers that don't even bother with our own language, we simply engage in this process of emulation as opposed to radical ishihad, radical religious reasoning, which is what the Quran states, do they not think and reflect? The word duwayla appears twice in the Quran and it's anchored and exists between the two lexicons or the two terms, dar, the two verbs, dar and zal, to circulate and to go away. We then have a word for state. And so we use the word that means the opposite of state to satisfy the white man's word. And no, caliphate, again, is not an Islamic concept. It derives after the prophet passed away, peace be upon him, because, and it comes from the term khulafa, which means we're all caretakers of the land. That's where it comes from. So there's no need for a single authority or a single figure, much less the concept of imam. The word imam means the direction in which we point, the direction to which we heed, which is ultimately the Quran in the wake of the Prophet's death. Islam is mistranslated submission, despite the word in Arabic for submission is khudu'a. Islam comes from the root salama, the three letter root, seen lam mean to willfully deliver, to deliver upon critical choice, upon critical thinking, but Orientalists and Muslims mistranslated this way and Muslims above all, without reflecting upon the insidious connotations that are associated because it's meant to suggest that we are savage, we are mindless, we do not think, we do not reflect in what it is that we believe in. Muslims sit down and read the Quran and chapters in the Quran as sort of the Nahru, sort of Rad, sort of Qamar, sort of Shams, the chapter of the moon, the chapter of the sun, the chapter of the ant, the chapter of the bee, the chapter of the elephant, and that they, they do not reflect upon the responsibilities to other than human life. What kind of inanity are we living? What kind of inanity are we living? Sovereignty for Muslims lies in the ummah, and traditionally the ummah is a pluriverse world that is not territorial, that includes Muslims and non-Muslims alike, mm -hmm. because the emphasis comes from the Medina Charter and the concept that I spoke about earlier, which is mu'mini. Mu'mini means believers, and traditionally in the ummah, the Zoroastrians, you had Sabians, you had Jews, you had Christians, you had Muslims, and so on and so forth. So again, the fact that you identify yourself as a Muslim means absolutely nothing. And when you look and trace the characteristic of one, what is a believer in the Quran? The believer is the one that cares for the earth, the minds, the rights of the poor, the orphans, the responsibilities toward the women, children, the elderly, and so on and so forth. Yeah, we don't reflect. We engage in waste. We engage in stuff. We don't reflect upon these dimensions. We lost the Arab Spring, and nothing is ever completely lost. But this is precisely my point that people play into the mass psychology of fascism. You had Nasserites, you had Sadatists, you had Marxist Leninists, you had leftists, you had feminists, you had anarchists in Bahrain Square, you had queers that marched with the gay pride. Okay, and it was these leftists, these feminists, these queers, and so on and so forth, these anarchists that called for the slaughter of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now I'm no fan of the Muslim Brotherhood, but I was there during the events of Rabbi al Okay, And of course, whenever I brought up the element of spirituality, two leftists, in a certain sense, they were very dismissive of it. When I brought even the element of queerness to a prominent Egyptian activist, who sadly enough is my brother, and I spent time with him, and he is in prison. If I, take, if I could take his, his place in prison, and that would make much of a difference, but it wouldn't, I would gladly do so. But when I brought up ear queer issues, his response was, do you want to me to set up a revolution and use this word? So forgive me, I don't mean to use this derogatory, derogatory word, but hawalef, which means facts. This is the absence of analysis when it comes to who is fetishized middle to upper class activists who are English speaking in Bahrain with zero organizing experience. The master's tools is never gonna dismantle the master's house. You ask people in Bahrain, what do you mean by bread, freedom, social justice? And you would get different answers even from the same ideological encampment. This becomes the problem. This is the problem. We're working through labels. This is how we lost Tahrir. This is how we continue to lose uh, our movements uh, in this purity politics. I'm not, well, there is no going back to 1492. There's no going back to the time of Muhammad. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in extracting the ethical and political and spiritual commitments that inform our cultures and traditions spirituality and so on and so forth. There have been invasive species that have been produced. Purple loose strike didn't exist in Turtle Island before. We need to learn how to live on the land, to live on the land with one another. 
this becomes the challenge. This is the conversation that we're contending with. And how do we do that? Now, of course, we have the Zapatistas and Fadas, who's John Hilbert Way, as others, with regards to an urban Zapatismo. But we need this under land. We need this under our agents. We need to get to know one another. Um, there's much that one could say. There's much that one should say, perhaps. Um, I sought to go through my own traditions and through my own practices. And my, my, my relationship with spirituality um, is another story altogether. But um, I'm very grateful for the ancestors and the movements and the organizing that I've been involved in for over 20 something odd years. Uh, I'm very humbled and honored to be amongst you all. Uh, I think there are many examples and experiments that we have undergone historically. Um, somebody wants to go pre Palestine and simply concerned with that, let them go fight it there. I am not impressed, and I shudder to think. I'm glad to see Jordanians out in the street. I'm glad to see 90 Egyptians. I was just there a few months ago in front of um, the journalist syndicate, Naqab al Sahabiyim. Great. Where is the organizing? This becomes the question. We look at what we have now as a part season. We have to understand. That organizing is about understanding structures. How much of a small number has he been a larger enemy? It's a David and Goliath situation. It's not a matter of most mobilizations, again, a career that fails. It's not about that. It's about organizing. It's about preparing, as the Quran says, in terms of strength. That becomes the impulse and the importance and so far as the building of alternatives. And don't worry, when we build the alternatives, the dominant order, which has its gaze vis-a-vis -vis surveillance, vis-a-vis co-intempro, because we don't trust one another, and there's no reason we should be trusting one another, will come for us. Violence is a tactic, it's not a strategy. And this becomes the key, but it's an inherently violent act, as Fanon said, because that means us figuring who we are in relationship to our own histories and in relationship to one another. There is no escape in violence. And this is why I started off by saying that we are born into violence. We deserve the means to defend ourselves. But one of the lessons that one learns from the Prophet, peace be upon him, is why they were not allowed and forbidden from actually engaging in acts of warfare, which is actually not jihad, the word for it in Arabic, that is the actual word, the Quranic word for fighting. Jihad, it's the greater struggle against oneself. There's the smaller jihad, yes, that can be fatal. Not all forms of jihad are fatal. Not all forms of fatal are jihad. But whose rules were laid down, the Prophet and the original polity were subjected to persecution, um, boycotting, torture. They had to engage into migrations to learn how to build. Building community is what is central in this project. And that is what threatens. The Zapatistas were not and are not large in numbers. The Panthers were not large in numbers, but look at how they shook the world. Look at what the Panthers did. And this is not to take away from, again, mistakes as so far as authoritarianism, as so far as sexism, as so far as queerphobia, and so far as vanguardism. But they built breakfast programs. They armed themselves. They catered to their people. But they, never, they did not walk as Malcolm or Martin. Neither did the hallways and corridors of power. They did not ask. We don't need to dismantle goddamn anything. We need to divest. Mm -hmm. There, if I am building with indigenous and black people on the land and growing my own food, I no longer have to shop at Wegmans or Walmart or whatever it is, wherever it is that I and others and all of us shop at. We have developed means of autonomy. Voting is not a form of harm reduction. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. People can use these dimensions as tactics, as voting. But when it becomes our sole investment every single day, out on the streets, and we're not building anything as an alternative. And we don't have a story to tell. We don't have a story to tell in relationship to how our struggles are intertwined. We just pay lip service. Oh, indigenous and black and people of color and Palestinian solidarity, we're all hand in hand. What is the narrative? What is the story? I'm going to conclude here um, and say that we need to relearn how to dream dangerously again. Mm -hmm. I beg upon you, we need, if colonialism has stolen anything from people of color, it is our ability to dream dangerous, really radically dangerous. Um, I'm very grateful again for this opportunity to, to be amongst you all, for my sister Kiki, 
uh, for all the organizers, and I, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any questions here or in the chat, um, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was amazing. I feel like um, both of you are just such incredibly powerful speakers. And yeah, you've worked so much that I get to think about that. I'm really so grateful. Pardon me, Britt. I just um, want to make sure. Can, can you hear us on? Can you hear Britt on Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. Great. Okay. <laughs> Um, my question is from Muhammad this time. I think I've got a few, so maybe I'll I'll rush through them quickly and then you can just pick one or none or whatever. But um one of them was I just wanted to hear more about the tension between decoloniality and anti-colonialism, which is kind of just a bit. Um and the second thing was I wondered if you've had, you know, this like the way that you're talking about organizing. Needing, we need like organizing, organizing. Can you see anyone doing that well in this moment? Or like, is there anywhere that I, I'm just thinking of like examples that we could look to for that kind of work? Um, and then what was the other thing? Just maybe this idea of like, you know, what it what it means to be a settler here and complicity and, and how maybe for you personally that figures into what Palestine has been trying to do. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try and keep uh, my thank you. Those are uh, important questions. Uh, to me, the difference between decolonization and anti colonialism, one can spend a fair bit of time, but I think that from the talk in so far as post colonialism or anti colonialism celebrates the return of uh, one's lands, one's resources to one's people in a certain sense. Decolonization means reconfiguring the entire order within itself. And this is the fault of post-colonialism. And I understand given the fact that we have a great deal of anti-colonial movements that are part of our genealogy, our lineage. I, I mentioned everybody from Kwame Turi to, 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 to Sankara to Lumumba and so on and so forth. But they try to use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. It's understandable. We're throwing away the shackles of colonialism. Nasser tried to, in a certain sense, do it with sort of the, the Pan Arab, even we have the Bandung, and so on and so forth. Right, Nasser even had the idea of smaller Africa in so far as combined Egypt. Uh, you have the labor uh, land in so far as Sudan and capital in so far as Libya. But they were still functioning within a status discourse. They did not go back to decolonize their own traditions to see if there are other modalities of governance that existed that would allow for a world of the below. Uh, and the people that we serve which is we serve one another. And so when it comes to the politics of the, the responsibility of settlers, it's a politics of responsibility because the state functions vis-a-vis -vis politics of rights. The lowest common denominator in terms of a faction or a group to get this party or that individual to be elected. And so far as examples, there are moments in time, but definitely as Kiki had noted, as, as Anna had lived, um, the Zapatistas, uh, God bless them. Uh, and of course, they're under assault by a leftist president Obrador right now. So, so much for uh, statist leftism, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the Zapatistas moments in that emerged out of the career of the communities, for instance, that I was a part of, uh, insofar as the social centers that we had built, uh, the community programs that we, we had uh, established, if you will, that were part of the public, that were open, and particularly emphasis was, was relearning our queer and feminist traditions from sort of a Muslim and Arab and North African and black landscape within itself. Then there are other movements that emerge out of Seattle, a great book I think I suggested to, to Keith, who's back there, what and that I contribute to the research for. The, the, the question after Seattle was, you know, what happened with all this anarchistic organizing? Because again, I, I the anarchism identity is only going to take me so far. If I said, well, Islam is inherently anarchistic to me, I have Tawheed, which is I only pledge allegiance to the sovereignty of the creator. The manifestation of that is the Ummah. I have Shura, Ijma'a, Maslaha, mutual consultation, Ijma'a, community consensus, Maslaha, public welfare, we're all Khulafa. There you go. There's the horizontal framework, right? Um, 
but insofar as um, um, just the wave of movements that Richard J. Day had analyzed that I did the research for insofar as Gramsci is dead. The, the book is called Gramsci is Dead. <laughs> uh, 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 Kiki knows the book, uh, um, Anarchist Currents in the New Social Movements. The, the question as I speak to my elder Ashanti, and this is the, 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 the dilemma, right, is that we're dots on a map from New York to California to all over. And, and I'd love to hear because I think Kiki's doing a lot of uh, amazing work on the ground so far as land and trying to think through and actually live and build alternatives. Um, but the question is, how do you connect these dots in such a way that the sovereignty, settler sovereignty can be disrupted by a different kind of sovereignty of the below, right? Um, uh, but that book talks about it, Islam and Anarchism, my own work tries to extend of that in a certain sense, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Kiki because she's doing amazing work with, with our fellow compas um, out on the West Coast. So, and there's a lot that's also happening in sort of the so-called Vancouver, uh, Unastotan territory, Harshawalia. I mean, th there's a lot of work that one can look to over there and I've known Harsha for over 20 years and, and God bless her, she, she certainly embodies those politics as well. So. Thank you. Did you want to respond to that as well, Kiki? Sure, just very briefly. That was really great, Mohammed. Um, this question of decolonization or decoloniality versus anti-colonization is really important because decolonization on the one hand has already happened in the legal sense. If we understand decolonization as legal, that's what took place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s after the Second World War. The decolonial school in academia is different in that it continues to talk about, it talks about how there's still a coloniality of power. Okay. Then there is anti-colonization or anti-colonial movements that are a bit distinct from the decolonial school. The decolonial school has a tendency to keep an above and below binary by placing the non-Europe non above Europe. So whereas under colonialism, Europe is above non-Europe, there's a flip. And so it maintains this binary of superiority and inferiority that it gets to the point where I remember hearing in, in graduate school, people telling other people not to read Marx, not to read Foucault because they're European. So it, it focuses a lot on epistemology, on knowledge, whereas anti-colonial projects, movements, you know, like the Zapatistas and others, don't want to maintain the uh, structure where there's a relation of domination. And this is in where we get the side by side by side by side, and also context is crucial, not just identity, because identity shift. So for example, to be a Jew in Germany is to be below, but to be a Jew in Palestine is to be above. And so if we look at the structure of domination, we, we can see that depending on context, those identities will shift. So if we only look at identities, then we get this idea that there is an, an, an identity that is an eternal oppressor or an eternal victim which is not true, context shifts. It's power circulation that is what's key. And if it's circulating in this hierarchical way, dominating, extracting, and even wishing to be part of the above, which is a lot of assimilationist politics, is the below that wishes, desires, prestige. This is George Jackson's theory of fascism, that advanced fascism functions by seeking prestige. He uses that word, prestige seeking to be above. So, so it is really important to talk about power and power in a way that doesn't replicate an above and below circulation. So and then in terms of organizing, what does that mean? And I think it's such a crucial uh, intervention that Muhammad makes on this distinction between mobilizing and organizing and the need to not just look at each other, but actually to struggle together. And that is love. And we do that through recognizing that we are different. It's not romantic. Revolution is not romantic. It's not just about how much we all have things in common, like how you know it would be with like a, a, a modern romance. It's about how we relate to difference. And that's why the point about differences, hospitality, disagreements, these are the crucial, the crucial points to look at 
when we're trying to build a world where many worlds fit. How can we build a world where many worlds fit by maintaining difference if we're not going to have a, a way to deal with conflict? That, that does not happen when we're marching in protest. It happens when we're trying to figure out how to feed the children, where to get the water, you know, shelter, these very basic life-sustaining activities that are land-based. We are land-based animals. We can't live in the ocean. We don't live in the air. We're land-based. So while many of us, and in fact, the majority of the world's population is now urban, having been pushed off the land, and land is continuing to be pillaged through extractivism, through commodity creation, then we're not going to be able to realize how exactly we can change this world that we live in because we keep needing capitalism in order to live, even though we're anti-capitalist. That's an enormous contradiction that if we need capitalism, then how are we really going to organize against it? And so then this question of what do we do as, you know, as settlers on these lands? This question is in the United States, it looks different um, to you know to 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 accompany indigenous struggles in the United States is a bit different than it is in Mexico or Guatemala or in other parts of Abiyayala uh, because of the the different strategies of extermination. So the United States strategy, Canada's strategy, has been extermination through assimilation and of course through genocide, bodily bodily ext extinction. In Mexico and Guatemala on down, the strategies were a bit different. We get this idea of mestizaje or being a Ladino, a mixed blood, but it's not about looking at our ancestral African or native roots. It's only looking at our European roots. Mm -hmm. Also in Mexico, native movements often organize in talking about autonomy, not sovereignty. Sovereignty is the heavier discourse in the United States. And a big distinction is, at least for us on the ground, we have a very small land liberation project up in the mountains that we've been in conversation with the Kitanamuk people who are the original and last stewards of the lands who have been displaced into a city now and have been seeking recognition from the Bureau of Indian Affairs in order to be able to build a casino there living in dire poverty and casino revenue would be really helpful for survival. The thing is, is that the tribal councils don't really care, don't really want anything to do with the land liberation project. They're focused on the casino, the members of the tribal council, but it is the, the people more below who are interested. And so it's our task to keep weaving those relationships in order to truly make it a land liberation project where it's not just for us or our community, all of us are Native, but Native from Mesoamerica up here on Shumash, Kitanamuk, and Tongva lands. And so we're trying to be in an ethical relationship, but knowing that the contexts are different. While we talk a lot about autonomy in Mexico and Guatemala, and we don't seek permission, although increasingly sadly in Mexico with this president who has co-opted so much native struggle in Mexico. Now it, it is turning more into this assimilation assimilationist movement. There's still a lot, there's still a lot of pockets of autonomous resistance in Mexico and Guatemala that don't seek permission to be free and still want to maintain our ways. And that's how we're going to get to a world where many worlds fit is by respecting different ways. This, and like Mohammed said, just to wrap that up, just to highlight this point, we need to be able to engage in disagreements in order to build and not destroy. If we're really looking for a world where we can all be who we, who we are going to be and not need to assimilate into who we're told to be in order to be valuable to not die. Thank you. Um, uh, anybody else have a question? Laura? Thank you. Um, thanks for those those talks. That was really inspiring. Mohammed, I really appreciated the distinction between mobilization and organization. I think there's a lot of 
Mm -hmm. Erase thoughts we need to have, and I think, and you guys have been emphasizing that. Thank you so much. I had a question for um, Kiki. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more while you were talking about the maps. Uh, what I was thinking is at the same time that the conquistadores were in Latin America, they were also doing all the inquisition and the burning of women in Europe. So I heard at one talk, I don't know if it was true, but um, someone said at a talk that the Romans considered barbarians as the ones who had women in the public sphere or where women were still fighting. And there, I think there was a lot of pagan knowledge and knowledge of the land still um, safe with those women that were burned in the Inquisition. So I was wondering if you could say something more about that. And thank you so much for your talk. Yeah, there is so much uh, where when it comes to this question of patriarchy, especially patriarchy, when we talk about capitalism, we can't uh, ignore patriarchy. Patriarchy has been a system of domination well before capitalism, well before colonialism. And that idea is of men having, or males over non-males, males having all the rights and the non-males having all the responsibilities, including death, including destruction, right? That's, that's the realm of death and destruction, whereas the above is the realm of life and survival. So with the Inquisition, there, there is an imposition. The Inquisition is an imposition of a one world world. And it looked like the expulsion and conversion of Jews and eventually Muslims and anybody different, including, of course, women. And this is something that was even took place before the Inquisition, before the one that we know from 1492, there was Inquisitions happening before. And it's really just this logic, just like patriarchy of an above and below of a superior and inferior, but it's 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 not one that is eternally based in on identity. It's so fascinating, Mohammed. Like when you talk about how the the father is the state and and the mother is capitalism, and it used to be that the state was superior to capitalism. The state managed capitalism. It, it, or not managed, dominated capitalism. And now we have a situation where it's the mother capitalism that is dominating the state, the, the use of force, right? And when we think about capitalism in this way, in this feminine way, it matches if we can understand that capitalism gets into our everyday life processes. It's not just buying or selling. It's about making it so in order to live, we have to be part of the system. We have to be able to buy. We need to be able to sell our bodies in order to receive income in order to then buy. So I just wanted to point that out because when I'm thinking about patriarchy, it's really important to recognize that <clears throat> the identity isn't just going to be women that is below. Because we have, like you said, right, Madeleine Albright, who said it was worth the killing of half a million Iraqi children, that it was worth it, the Iraq war, and uh, Margaret Thatcher of neoliberalism's construction in the 80s. <laughs> so I'm sure that there's other folks. I mean, maybe, Mohammed, you, you have studied this more than I have, the specific inquisitions against women. I know Silvia Federici is a classic with Caliban and the witch in that case. She was writing about how with the modern medical system, the modern medical system became male dominated and women were a threat. Women as herbalists, as midwives, women who had these other knowledges and continue to have no other knowledges, but that didn't fit in into that one world way. And so then were understood as powerful and therefore a threat and needed to be burned, needed to be killed, needed to be dominated, and it continues today. So, um, <clears throat> question for maybe both of you, but um, on that side of mobilization versus organization, you said it begins with understanding power structure. Um, and if you, you know, if I think of World War III, World War IV being maybe the collision of the competition between power structures and their assimilation into capitalism, 
interested to hear what you think about what World War V is. We're at a point where the nexus now where mobilization organization, uh, there's an escalation you know, between various power structures of the West and the East. And um, going back to that map, 1501, um, maybe it's a hard thing to conceive of, but maybe a necessary thing too, or is this a moment where you see um, movement happening and maybe opportunities to kind of overcome some of these uh, degraded, really antiquated systems that are hurtful or exploited. And, and then I guess to shorten my question, do you think that World War V, so to speak, is um, maybe something that we could, we could take on? Like, go first. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Compa, I thought that's what you asked if you'd like to go first. No, no, I, I was asking you if you'd like to go first. I, I, oh, I yeah. Um, I heard, I think I heard the whole question and it's, and it's about World War Five. Is it about what it would look like? Is that what the question was? Yeah. No. Well, do you think it's if World War is if, if there's competition between power structures, it was World War Four in the context of capitalism. Now with Palestine, now with Ukraine, now with Taiwan, and now with America, do you see a World War Five coming mm -hmm. together? And do you think it's something that we're ready to sort of go through in order to evolve to get out of these? That's a great question. You know, it depends on how we define capitalism. World War IV is a war that started when the Soviet Union fell and the world from above accepted capitalism. But what is capitalism? And this is really important uh, to help to define our terms so that we can understand each other. So I'll define two ways of understanding capitalism and the one that I subscribe to. So one common way of defining capitalism is a system where ex the exploitation is of the waged worker, whereas where slavery, the exploitation is of the enslaved and the feudal system is the exploitation of the serf, capitalism is the exploitation of the waged worker. And so then capitalism's essence is grounded by the waged worker. And of course, other Feminist Marxists would say, well, it's not just the wage worker that keeps up capitalism. Uh, Silvia Federici, shout out again, is part of that school that talks about how women are at wages of zero, super exploited, because they're workers for capitalism vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear family uh, by reproducing social life within the household. Here we have, though, a question. What happens when the worker waged or not, gets transformed out of existence. And this is something theorized by the Black Panther co-founder, Black Panther Party co-founder Huey Newton, a speech at Boston College, 1970, where he's pointing to MIT just being right across the way and about, and he's talking about automation, mm -hmm. automation as transforming the waged worker out of existence. And so then if that is true, and we see it increasingly, 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 then is that still capitalism? There is a debate about this heavy in Latin America and not just Latin America, the crisis group in Germany is also part of that, Moshe, Moshe Polstone also about this question if the essence of capitalism is the labor of the waged worker or if it's, or, or if, if it is, then we're in another system then maybe we just don't have a name for it yet. If we think about capitalism as a system that's broader though, and this is the part that what I subscribe to, capitalism as a system that devalues the energy, the life of the earth in as much as it can in order to extract profit. And a very simple uh, way to describe this is under capitalism, there are a few assumptions that are really important and when it comes to exchange, so for example, if I make paper and Mohammed makes pencils and we want to exchange, under capitalism, we can't gift that to gift them to each other. We have to exchange in a way that can account for some kind of equivalence. And that equivalence begins by time, labor time. So Mohammed, one hour of pencils, my one hour of paper is exchanged. And so there, those assumptions are what? That we're equal 
because Muhammad's hour and my hour are equal. Two, that we're both the property owners of the paper and the pencils. And three, that we can maintain agreements. We can uphold contracts with each other after this exchange. I'm not going to say that he stole my stuff and, or anything like that. So we have equality, ownership, and contracts, which is the foundations of a liberal system of rights where the individual has rights. But And, and it seems completely fine until you ask the question of what about the tree? What about the tree? What about the labor of the tree? What about, you know, did anyone ask consent for the tree to be able to make the paper and the pencils, right? There is, there is no creating a contract with a tree. A tree does not have rights under capitalism. And that is where the enslaved worker comes in. The enslaved worker is not a waged worker. And this is what bl the black Marxist and radical tradition will tell us that black people do not fit neatly into the waged worker paradigm of Europe. Black people, especially here on this continent and native people who have been relegated to be closer to, to, to nature, whether as, as beasts of burden, for example, don't have the same rights as the waged worker. So under a more traditional Marxist lens that understands the waged worker as the essence of capitalist production, of capitalism, the dialectic, the tension is between the worker and the boss. But that, that dialectic exists within the human, the realm of the right, the one that has rights. The bigger dialectic, the bigger tension is the human and the non-human. Capitalism is a system that relegates the earth as much as possible to that non-human realm that doesn't have rights, that, who, that does not create value. That way capitalism, which seeks profit, can extract from it. And so then if that is our understanding of capitalism, that's my understanding of capitalism, then we're in the fourth world war and it's i can't i can't really see a fifth world war because the fourth world war is its logical conclusion is extinction if it is going to relegate earth capital against anything that gets in its way and what we're seeing right now geopolitically everyone is talking about the BRICS: brazil russia india china south africa plus those who just joined including egypt saudi arabia iran Everyone is talking about the BRICS as an alternative to US empire, as if it's some kind of revolutionary force, as if it's the global South. But if you, the global South and the global North are actual geographies because under the third world war, under the so-called badly named Cold War, if you look at a map, NATO and the USSR are in the North. Africa, Central and South America are in the South. When did Russia become part of the global south? When did even China become part of the global south? So when we're talking about the BRICS as an alternative to empire, it's not an alternative to empire. It's not anti-capitalist. The BRICS are challenging the US petrodollar right now, the dollar that is not tied to gold since Nixon. And it is trying to create another currency or set of currencies that are backed by commodities. Where do those commodities come from? Where does gold come from? It's through mining, it's through extractivism, it's through continued genocide, like in the Congo, for example, where people there are dying in order for a Green New Deal type of capitalism, a green capitalism to continue, where the problem only becomes fossil fuel energy production but the lifestyle that is extractive of the earth is not questioned. The lifestyle of capitalism is not questioned. Back in the 90s, when I was in business school and I was hearing all about globalization, the professors were telling us globalization is the answer and globalization is not sustainable. If the whole world lived the lifestyle of the United States or these other quote unquote developed countries, we would need four earths. We're in a situation where that statistic is now five Earths. It's not even sustainable for these developed countries to continue living like this. We're in a planetary emergency of climate collapse. So I don't see how there could be a fifth world war if nobody is here to even fight it. I'll leave it there. Go ahead. Ooh, 
Um, I, I don't have much then. Uh, <laughs> he, he actually had noted. Um, maybe just to extend a little so far as uh, a question of materiality, precisely vis a vis the examples that he had noted for the the tree, the rights of the tree that are dismissed, the wood, the soil, the land that is not. My concern is the fact that we're not, and I agree with her again, that we're not going to see it this one. Uh, this is it. From a geopolitical level, what we are witnessing right now, and I want to just talk like geopolitics, at least so far as, again, to hang for so far as Palestine. Um, right now, you have an axis that calls itself the axis of resistance, which is problematic. Right. Um, and I want to distinguish for a moment movements versus states, because you have state and non-state actors, Hamas, Hezbollah in a certain sense, or uh, maybe it's in between at this stage, um, Hezbollah, um, versus Iran, right, which is a state actor, Syria, which is in a certain sense in shambles, right, and the option that was offered, obviously, because again, I want to relate what is going on to movements. That's my concern. My concern is the world of the below. As much as I'm paying attention to what the structures are doing. That because of the absence of alternatives, insofar as the context of Syria, right, and Libya, insofar as traditional modalities of indigeneity, what I would refer to as fitra in Islam, indigeneity translates because indigeneity is an analytic, just as much as settler is not much of an identity, as much as an analytic, as much as, of course, there are pretend Indians, as much as I'm not going to reinforce sort of Elizabeth Warren or Nancy Reagan style, you know, uh, appropriation of indigenous identity. A lot of scholars, intellectuals, obviously, have been outed fairly recently and over the past years for being pretend Indians. Right? Nor am I feeding into race to innocence, logic as Shireen or Zak would call it, but rather a connection so far as the fitra, the original agency that the child, each and every single one of us. I always say that when was the I and I, and I and I, when I was a wee within my mother's womb, I ate through her, I breathed through her. My mother, when she gets upset at me, she says, don't forget you shot through me. And it's true, I shot you out, but this is a reality. Our, my, my existence would not have been functional without being within her embryo, within her womb, right? I, 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 my entire life is mediated, but then the individual is born and the degree of subjectification is established, individualism, and so on and so forth. And we replicate. The problem with capitalism is not only the commodification materialization, obviously, of us, which is horrific within itself, but also non other than non-human life and what it is that has to teach us. This is the importance of understanding it so far as our indigeneity is tied also with the concept, at least in Islam, that I know the three things that any revolutionary movement has to at least aspire to. But then there is what non-human life other than non-human life has to teach us. So it, historical materialism is only going to take us so far because it doesn't allow room for cosmovisions and what, again, the earth, the land, has to teach us. The Quran says, When we've created you for times and nations so that you may get to know one another, including non human life, that have a symbiotic relationship, but we've severed, like a jacket sleeve or an artery, that umbilical cord, that lifeline that we have. The question is, when we are together as movements on the ground, and a relationship to what Israel is trying to push and so far as well today, they identified three cows, the red cows, red papers that were imported from the US and this is the sign of the second coming or the coming of the Messiah, right? And this evangelical Zionist push, they're just like, we need to now build the temple. We need to officially eradicate Al-Aqsa. Well, you had a church before that and now you had Al-Aqsa and now we need to establish the temple. Right. The question is, to what extent can the surrounding people in neighboring nations be organized beyond mobilization? To what extent can we over here disrupt again settler sovereignty in such a way that it threatens empire from within, that it would have to distract in a certain sense its gaze inwards more than it is already is, 
beyond sending weapons elsewhere. Um, and the only way to do that is by asserting indigenous sovereignty to push it, to challenge that center sovereignty. That's the only lens. I mean, America is very, it's different than so-called Canada because it constructs its history from 1619. It begins with slavery and the race is the original sin. Canada plays the superficial, oh, well, we'll pay lip service to the fact that this is stolen land and so on and so forth, but we won't do anything really about it, nonetheless. Um, so to what extent can movements organize? And this is now the question in relationship to capitalism and the third, fourth world war, and capitalism subsuming us, because as I said, fascism is a mass psychology. Even if we're living together, even if Kiki and I, and God forbid that it happens that way, particularly her and I, given Alhamdulillah, inshallah, are continuing and burgeoning and, and growth and maturing and, and learning how to disagree ethically. At what point, when it comes to survival, is it going to be her versus I, despite the fact that we share the same ethical political link? Living together is not easy. Getting to know one another is not easy and discussions over how high the dishes are and who's doing what and so on and so forth is not easy. And I've lived that. We built social sort of I've been a part of building social centers and within a year, the social centers still exist, but the original community that built it had completely exploded apart. <laughs> First, it was like encampments and then these encampments that were against this person exploded and imploded within themselves. Living together is not easy. If there's one thing that I've learned is the most important characteristic of it, any of us that is learning how to become human, because we're always in the process and the project of becoming, of growth. And the set of conjunctive ends, not destructive words, mm -hmm. is capable of doing is humility. Humility means the fact that you can listen to somebody else and not just hear them, that you're willing to incorporate and embrace an anti authoritarian effort, that you want to learn and you want to grow and you might want to mature with it. This becomes key in our own inner undoing, in our own inner unsettling from our own. This is why I love the concept of jihad and akbar. I've been socialized by matriarchal, patriarchal privileges. I will fight them till the day that I die, till I'm six feet under. And I don't take anything with me besides what I've done in the name of my humility. Uh, I think people can organize themselves in humble ways, in ways where they want to learn, and get to know, and disagree with one another, with full hearts to rethink, again, the stereotypes that we've internalized. This is the possibility in our version or our possibility of us able to salvage whatever sense of humanity that we may still have and to show different people a different way of life, the so-called masses a different way of life. I am the masses convinced because there's nothing that is powerful enough, forgive me, to convince them with the conviction that their spirituality has let alone that offers itself as an alternative. We need each other up, we gobble each other up. And I, I mean, I, one sees, you know, like one can get into discussions of Muslim Zapatistas because Muslim Zapatistas exist and I spend time with them and so on and so forth. But there are all sorts of kinds of discussions that need to be had. Um, but anti-authoritarianism becomes central. And I've revised that. There's a difference between, and Kiki had noted this, God, the ten sisters bless her and the ten God bless her. The difference between anti-capitalism and non-capitalism. There's a big difference. Anti-capitalism is a rhetorical stance. Oh, I'm at, you know, Che Guevara on a t-shirt, Malcolm on a t-shirt, Trudeau wearing, I am a feminist and marching in pride, selling billions of dollars worth of weaponry to Saudi Arabia that beheads queer people and jails women and so on and so forth because they want to drive. Now they, he's given that liberal right to them. This is a third reincarnation of him assimilating into the world fully of the above, as we're speaking, right? To become one in every single possible sense. But there's a difference between that and engaging in non-capitalist. That means deriving the concepts, the practices in my own traditions in relationship to others without appropriating or engaging in Indian grandmother syndrome or usurping that which doesn't belong to me. That becomes the junction. And, and this is why I mentioned storytelling. Uh, I, 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 I'm, Israel is trying to drag Iran, Hezbollah into this battle, and they may succeed, they may not. Hezbollah has been acting in very restrained ways. And again, I have issues with Hezbollah. I have issues with Hamas. I have issues. And these are different manifestations of different forms of Islamism. But this is why the question of Islam and disfiguration becomes so critical insofar as where is the Islam of the oppressed? Where is the Quran of the oppressed? 
Where's the project that Malcolm started? What would Malcolm have to say about Islam now had he been given the life and not assassinated as many uh, as MLK and so on and so forth with regards to his relationship with James Baldwin, a queer black man, and so far as queer Islam? What would he say about Saudi Arabia? The beauty about Malcolm is the fact that he engaged in this project of metamorphosis continuously. I mean, he wasn't beholden to, to a center, to an institution. The Malcolm before and after the nation of Islam is not the same one before and after Mecca, let alone the one that was that was weaned the way that he was in and out of prisons. This is the beauty, and this is the reverence why we hold Malcolm to high aspirations. But he was unrelenting because he knew his compass was straight. Where would his growth be, his maturing be now, his project to be in relationship to indigenous people and so on and so forth and outside the dominant group in relationship to Saudi Arabia? That becomes the very crucial axis. I'm against the mullahs in Iran. <laughs> and with Mahsa Amin, no woman should be told how she dresses or the hijab or not hijab. There's not even a question so far as that. But this is Muslims losing the sight of the trunk of the tree. And, oh, it's about this or about that, about the drinking. Muslims were drinking for the first 10 years. Sorry, I'm like like diverging on different tangents because I'm trying to add a little bit of dual politics to, again, this historical moment that we're raising. So I'm against Bashar al-Assad. I call him the butcher of the masses. But you ask me now in comparison to, say, 2015, yeah, he's still the butcher of the masses, but please, Leave him in power until we figure out an alternative because the other side has managed to mobilize Daesh and logistically supported it. And these 14-year-old girls that are leaving the UK who had never been in a predominantly Muslim country, what had caused hundreds of thousands of them to go and flee to Iraq and Afghanistan ah, or to Iraq and Syria? Ah, because they knew. We all know. All Muslims know. We're weaned on this idea of the global ummah. And they saw, yeah, it's an arbitrary line between Iraq and Syria. It's the Levant. Yes. The problem with Daesh is the fact that it was anchored in the wrong ethical political dream. But that dream speaks to every single beating Muslim because that's what we're raised on. What are we? The only way you kill an idea is by an alternative. And again, we're going to get a Daesh 2.0 because we move from the MB to Al Qaeda to ISIS. This is the constant reincarnation and why that battle becomes really important. But leave Bashar, leave the mullahs until we figure out on the ground. It's not because I'm with them, it's because we need to find an alternative right now in this state of urgency and emergency because this is for me this is it and again i iterate i believe in science of course i do all our traditions by traditions <laughs> except that science and scientific methodologies which are denied and used against us and so far as the size of our cranians and eugenics and all that all that the white europe had, had, had mobilized but she has her own timetable and schedule tsunamis the earthquakes we cannot anticipate or predetermine that with all the magnanimity that we endow upon ourselves. And this is why I say the state of urgency. She doesn't rationalize the way that we perceive in our superior magnanimity that she should or that we would, because we're actually at the bottom of the food chain. Plants don't require us nor animals. Animals, at least, they have some ethics and codes <laughs> by which they live in. We, we, we've been stripped of that, and we stripped ourselves of that and on other than on human life, all that. So, and we will be accountable at some point or another, in my humble opinion, in this world and the next for it. So, but, but yeah, I, I don't think there is a worthy witness to this. This is the end. So, we really need to organize more quickly. So. Okay, folks. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul. Uh, we do have to, we do have to come, come to an end now, although thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Kiki Nish, and, and um, yeah, thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you for spending this Friday. And, and uh, speaking of mobilization, uh, I do want to tell you to go out uh, in protest and meet some people <laughs> and make some connections. Uh, tomorrow at uh, you had said what what time now? There are two. There are two. Noon at City Hall. Noon at City Hall. And five p.m. Times Square. And five p.m. at Times Square. Um, and if you are interested in in uh, participating with CUNY for Palestine, um, yeah. Do you want to organize for us to come and talk to me or Nara in the circle? Okay. Yeah. Um, and would you like to make any closing remarks? Uh, 
If I may, I just as I do, I'm an education promoter uh, of popular education. And if you're interested in learning more about the Fourth World War and helping develop an analysis that's adequate for our time, uh, there's that documentary that you can watch, which I think is excellent. The Fourth World War, it's live streaming. I put it on the, in the chat. And also this book, the World War Four, the Fourth World War, it's the book it's pretty thick of the compilation. It's a compilation of the Zapatistas theor theorizations on the Fourth World War and the storm and their proposal for how to get through the storm, which is not treating land as property. It's building the commons again and defending them. And something about this book is that it is bilingual. Oh. So it has the original Spanish on one side and then aligned perfectly is the English. So it also helps for language acquisition either way. And the essays range from 1997 till December, 2023. Great, thank you. La lucha sigue, Zapata vive. Zapata vive. Uh, Dejiro, thank you, all my love and respect again. Thank you to me for Palestine. Thank you to all of you, River, my sister Tiki. I will see you very soon. Um, I miss you. Um, and the free Palestine, we need the free Turtle Island, we need the free Africa. Um, that's that's all that there is to it. It's that simple and it's not complicated. So thank you all again. <laughs> Please get the sign on your way out. Yes, please. Can you probably sign the sign-up sheet? Please sign the sign-up sheet.